Thanks to Steve at Wegmans for allowing me to talk to you folks. Uh, in some cases, I should be available uh, live to answer questions. If I can't, hopefully if they're not answered, that Steve can gather them and I can get back to you. Um, so my name is Craig Kalki. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension Lake Ontario Fruit Team, uh, mainly with tree fruit and small fruit growers in the commercial belt along Lake Ontario in Western New York. Uh, I've dealt with food safety and the forms of FSMA grower trainings, GAPS workshops, on-farm readiness reviews, helping growers get ready for uh, helping growers with their food safety plans, prepping them for audits and inspections. Uh, I've been doing it for about 11 or 12 years. This topic is near and dear to me, uh, cleaning and sanitizing food contact surfaces and apple harvesting and storage. I outlined and gave a little bit about my background already. I'm going to focus on picking bag sanitation, storage, and record keeping. Not going to talk about bins. I know Laura and Alexis will talk about uh, bins a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to talk about auditor and inspector perspectives. I talk to them on the phone, what they're seeing on their audits and inspections. Grower perspectives, are they using SOPs? Uh, what they've heard on, heard on audits and inspections, what they've been dinked on. And then knowledge gaps, I'm just going to introduce. Uh, Laura and Alexis are going to cover this in detail. Uh, we know there's many types of picking bags, different types of materials. Are there potential differences to the ability to effectively sanitize these? You're going to find yes. Uh, and what are the potentials of contamination? So picking bag sanitation, uh, what auditors and inspectors are seeing on their third-party audits and FISMA inspections seem to fall roughly into three categories, about 20%. 20% inspect and replace worn parts, but don't really clean uh, or sanitize at all. 60% replace and wash the skirts, and sometimes they wipe with a uh, one-part bleach, 10-part solution of bleach and water. Uh, some do at the beginning of the season, some weekly or daily, some as needed. And about 20% seem to use sanitizing wipes in the same type of schedule. They might just use them at the beginning season, sometimes weekly or daily, sometimes as needed. I think as needed seems to be preferred by most regulators. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about these different things as sanitizers and if they're labeled for food contact surfaces uh, in a bit. Picking bag storage as recommended by auditors, inspectors, barn, office, and bus if they can. Um, sometimes the pickers all start out in a central location and end in a central location. So they can store their buckets uh, in the barn, in an office, in a storage area, in the buses that they might use to go to and from uh, the different blocks that they're picking in. Uh, but sometimes the farms are not in a central location. There's several farms um, and they don't all go back to the same place. Sometimes the pickers might drive their own cars. So in that case, they might be bringing them home. Uh, better if they leave them in their cars, but if they have to bring them home, put them in a mudroom, vestibule, hang outside, that's what they think. You don't want contamination. Uh, they have animals in the house if they're putting other things in uh, those picking buckets. Besides apples, we do want that, obviously. Uh, grower perspectives, mainly those same three categories. Uh, some might re replace X percentage of picking bags a year with new ones. Some will glue in new liners every other year. One crop consultant talked about cleaning with Dawn antibacterial dish soap, although I could not find any literature of any of the antimicrobial soaps that says it could be labeled to make a solution for food contact surfaces. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So labeled sanitizers for food contact surfaces, such as picking bags, are really in short supply. Um, the one to 10 solution of commercial bleach to water, um, you would need to rinse with potable water after this. So the range of sodium hypochlorite to sanitize food contact surfaces is 50 to 200. Uh, if you're over 200 parts per million, you have to rinse, have a rinsing step. So if you have a standard 5.25% sodium hypochlorite bleach solution, all you need is one tablespoon of bleach and one gallon of water to give you the maximum 200. that can be used on food contact surfaces without a rinse step. For comparison, a one to 10 solution is over 4,000 parts per million. So you're leaving heavy residue of chlorine that uh, it could be dangerous. Uh, Lysol or Clorox wipes, all of the labels require rinse with potable water for use on food contact surfaces. So if you have canvas picking bags and you're using these Lysol wipes, you really should be rinsing them with potable water afterwards. And then you have the drying step to worry about. The Dawn dish soap, all the antibacterial soaps, like I said, I couldn't find anything on their labels for making a solution uh, for cleaning food contact surfaces. So for now, I really think it's a one teaspoon to one gallon of bleach solution. 
If you have a concentrated bleach, like eight point something percent, you're gonna have to lower that probably tablespoon to a teaspoon. Storage is done by growers in season. I talked about Vans Barnes. If they're brought home by pickers, um, they got a hammer for them to only use them for apples when they're picking. Off season, a lot of times they're stored in covered apple bins and in closed storage units and a shed with elevated racks. A grower had a shed um, for use for something else. And they said, wow, that'll be great for storing picking bags in, in the off season. And enclosed barn, uh, enclosed barn is a caveat because we all know that a lot of barns have holes in them and there's birds roosting in there. That is okay if you take a couple steps. I was on an on farm readiness review where they stored their picking bags uh, in the off season on these hooks. Uh, they were stored up, hanging upside down and open. So that's perfect. You don't have anything building up in the in there. If there's any debris, it's not going to gather inside the picking bag. And also they had like a two by six board over the top of the hooks. So if any birds were pooping in the barn, they were going to land on the boards and not on the picking bags. So that's totally fine. Comments from auditors, inspectors, a main peeve, they pick, pet peeve, they don't want to see picking bags on the ground with when not in use. Uh, back of a truck, hanging from a post, anywhere but on the ground. Uh, growers do reinforce this with pickers because they've been dinged on it before in audits and inspections. Also, they also hammer home, nothing goes in those except apples during harvest. You don't put your lunch in them. You don't put your boots in them. You don't put your laundry in them. Um, they have to take them home. This is especially important. And I, I think they're doing a good job of communicating that to the pickers. Record keeping, most of you know, equipment, an equipment cleaning and sanitizing record keeping log is a requirement of FISMA. Uh, they're not necessarily looking for that on third party audits, but it's a FISMA requirement. Uh, there's a sample record keeping sheet here that you can get off the Produce Safety Alliance website under resources, and you can modify these uh, forms for your operation. Date and time, what kind of equipment are you cleaning and sanitizing or just cleaning? What is your method? Do you have an SOP? Are you referencing that SOP? Uh, speaking of SOPs, I've developed a picking bag SOP several years ago with, with food safety people from the Produce Safety Alliance and with Ag and Markets inspectors. Um, I think so far it stands the test of time. I'll need to review it before harvest. Uh, and if there's any revisions, I'll make that available to folks. Knowledge gaps, again, there are different types of picking bags, different types of materials. There's canvas, plastic, bone. There's these hybrid materials like Cordera. Um, there's potential differences to sanitize these, definitely. Uh, are there, what are the potentials? So that is a segue for Laura and Alex to talk about their research and other research uh, in this arena. Um, thank you for your time. And I will hopefully be available live for questions. And if not, I can certainly get back to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for letting us participate in the 2024 Wegmans Food Safety Meetings. My name is Laura Strawn, and I'm an Associate Professor and Extension Specialist at Virginia Tech, and my co-pilot for today's talk will be Dr. Alexis Hamilton, an Assistant Professor and Extension Specialist also at Virginia Tech. Today, we'll be talking to you about don't be left holding the bag, improving harvest bag and storage food safety. First on deck is our harvest bag project. This project was completely born out of industry need. In Virginia, we were getting calls from tree fruit growers and packers about auditors questioning how often harvest bags are cleaned and sanitized. Craig did a wonderful job. This was also in parallel going on in New York and other apple producing states we kept getting the same questions. What do we know about harvest bags? We know their food contact surfaces and what are the potential cross-contamination risks. The objectives of this study were twofold. We first wanted to look at the survival and transfer of generic E. coli and foodborne pathogens from harvest bags to apples. And then we wanted to look into solutions. What could we do in terms of cleaning and sanitizing of these harvest bags? How would we clean them? A wet-based, a dry-based sanitizer? When should we do it? And here we wanted to dive in to all of these. The first thing we did was reach out to all of our apple packers in the state of Virginia, as well as our colleagues and friends in other states. We really wanted to get a good, broad understanding of what types of harvest bags were in use. Here, we were able to find out that harvest bags 
were predominantly made out of a cordura material, sometimes a canvas material, often with nylon or leather appendages. We were also able to reach out to the companies that produce these bags and see if we can get some bags donated. So between our industry stakeholders who gladly were able to give us some used bags as well as the companies who were able to give us new bags, we had a pretty good variety of harvest bags of different materials to test in the lab. So let's get an idea of what these laboratory trials look like. We first started out with generic E. coli. Generic E. coli is not a pathogen, but it is a really good indicator of potential fecal contamination, and we use it a lot in laboratory studies to get a baseline. Here we started with different material types of nylon, canvas, and cordura, as well as a temperature of 22 Celsius, which is about 75 Fahrenheit. We picked two different relative humidities, 30 and 80%, to give us a pretty good broad range of low humidity environments, something you would find on the West Coast, and maybe higher humidity climates that you might find on the East Coast. We all know that humidity can vary from day to day, so this gave us a really good opportunity to get a distribution of what was going on. We also wanted to look at a series of different time points. We started with four and eight hours, the course of a normal harvest day, and then subsequently went out from there. One, two, three, seven, 14, 30, 60, and 90 days. Here we figured that on average, an apple harvest might go on for two to four months, depending on where you are in the country. And so this would give us a really good idea in case there were absolutely no sanitation of these bags. So we would see if they were used during the entire harvest, what actually happened. Additionally, from our results with generic E. coli, we wanted to dive deeper into what happens with our foodborne pathogens. We picked two foodborne pathogens, Listeria monocytogenes and Salmonella. These are both two very different foodborne pathogens with different ecology. From here, we narrowed down our material types to canvas and cordura, which are the most common material types seen on a harvest picking bag. So let's get into the results of our harvest picking bags. Here we're looking at die off of generic E. coli on different harvest bag material types held at 30 and 80% relative humidity. We have two figures that are each three panels. Our 30% relative humidity is on the left side of the screen and our 80% is on the right side of the screen. Our level of contamination or our log CFU per coupon of generic E. coli is shown on the Y axis you can see that there is absolutely, no matter the material type of canvas, which is our red line or cordura, which is our green dash line or nylon, our blue dash line, there is no growth. We do not see any growth of E. coli on these bags, regardless of the material type. We only see reduction. The level of reduction is different between the material types. With canvas having the least reduction, it's our better survivor on our bags. This is likely due to canvas being a porous material type. Cordura had the best reduction overall. We also did not see much difference between the 30 and 80% relative humidity. We still saw the same general trends. We saw two large breakpoints on these figures. Our first red arrow shows Within about four to six hours, we see a one log reduction or our first break point, which indicates that we saw significant die off. Our next break point was at 21 days, where we also see about a two, potentially to two and a half log reduction of our generic E. coli over time. And remember, these bags are not being cleaned or sanitized. This is just generic E. coli on a picking bag. These results held true when we looked at our foodborne pathogens. Here we're using a similar setup. We're looking at die off of foodborne pathogens on different harvest bag material types. Since we didn't see a significant difference between our relative humidities and we saw the same general trends and patterns, here we're looking at a 55% relative humidity. This allows us to make better recommendations on a broader scale across the board. We can see graphs for Listeria monocytogenes and Salmonella. 
Here we have Canvas and Cordura. So we picked our best and least survivor. If you have Listeria monocytogenes or Salmonella on a harvest picking bag, we do not see growth. I, we see a three log reduction of Listeria monocytogenes and approximately a two log reduction of Salmonella. And again, our Canvas is the better survivor. This is likely due to Canvas being a porous material versus our Cordura, which is a hybrid blend material and is less porous and more waterproof. Once we knew that if our bags were contaminated, foodborne pathogens could survive on the bags for a period of time, we wanted to look at the likelihood of transfer. So what would happen if apples were in that picking bag? So with our experiments that we set up, we were able to determine that regardless of weight or pressure, if apples touched contaminated surfaces, transfer did occur. This was really important. So it didn't matter if there was an entire bag of apples that were full or if there were only one or two apples in the bag. Pressure or weight was not important when it came to transfer. Basically, if a surface was contaminated and an apple touched it, transfer could occur, though in a very low percentage. We also saw less transfer occurred when we used a dry inoculum, and this was to simulate dry conditions. Transfer still did occur, but significantly less. So it seemed that it was important to keep things dry as we saw more transfer if things were wet. We also saw less transfer in our Cordura bags compared to Canvas. One of the other things we wanted to look at were actually solutions. We understand that if bags become contaminated, the contamination can hang around for a while. We understand now that if apples touch a contaminated surface, like a harvest picking bag, transfer could occur. A bite, it's way less if things are dry and it's less in Cordura bags instead of Canvas bags or our other types of bags. So now we wanted to look at harvest bag sanitation. What could we do? So here we started off by looking at a couple of different treatments. So here on the side, we have our treatments, chlorine, IPA quats, peroxyacetic acid, steam, and water. The red dots symbolize that those treatments are dry or dry based. So what we can see here is that if the number is higher, that is our log reduction of our organisms. So here, these are our foodborne pathogens on these different types of materials. So we saw IPA quat and peroxyacetic acid had some of the higher reductions. Our steam was actually disappointing in terms of we didn't see much of a difference between our water. One of the things that did really surprise us was this chlorine result. Chlorine is a common sanitizer that's used and it's really usually pretty effective. We were using this at about 200 parts per million, and so to see that we didn't get any reduction, it actually was similar to the water and less than our other types of treatments was really surprising. This is when it helps to have industry collaborators and extension specialists on the team to be able to look at these results and have the common sense test. Chlorine was certainly not passing it. For those of you who have worked with chlorine before, while it is cheap, sometimes it can be a little bit more finicky in terms of getting the efficacy right. So we wanted to think about this. Could organic material on the coupons be interfering with our chlorine? We know chlorine has a tendency to bind with our organic material, so then we're actually sanitizing our organic residues. But we said we were starting off with clean coupons, so we quickly decided that this was probably not the right answer. Were we using an old bottle of chlorine or an old solution we had mixed up? This we know chlorine or often sanitizers can lose efficacy and degrade over time, but we had purchased a brand new bottle of chlorine and we knew that the solution was made up with the proper calculations that day did we verify the solution? We know all the time that we need to be, make sure that we verify our solution is at the proper concentration. We did this as well. We knew that with our test strips, it was at about 200 parts per million. What was going on? For those of you who are thinking in your brains, what is going on? We forgot about pH 
and how important pH is when it comes to chlorine. pH is not as important when it comes to peroxyacetic acid or some of the other treatments on this list. Since we ourselves forgot about how important pH is when it comes to the efficacy of hypochlorites or chlorine, we thought we would do a little bit of a recap. If you've taken the Produce Safety Alliance Grower Training class, you'll very much remember this concept. So at high pH, hypochlorous acid converts to hypochlorite ions, so it disassociates, and these hypochlorite ions are relatively ineffective against pathogens, which makes sense. If we added our chlorine to our solution to get it to our 200 parts per million, we probably jacked up our pH, and it turns out we did. Our pH was 10, and the effective range for pH needs to be significantly less, usually between 6 and 7.5. We had, in fact, made our solution very ineffective against pathogens because of that high pH, and we basically had all of our ions disassociate, and they were absolutely not working. That was a big bummer. A visualization of this is on the next slide. So this is just a really nice animation to remind you that free chlorine doesn't always mean free and active chlorine, or in this case, where more isn't always better. Remember, free chlorine consists of a combination of hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite ions. At a pH of approximately 7.5, the ratio of these two in water is 50-50. As our pH increases above 7.5, the ratio shifts towards those hypochlorite ions, which do not help you get any pathogen kill. As our pH decreases below 7.5, this ratio shifts towards our hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid is the more effective sanitizer than our hypochlorite ions which are completely not really very effective. Remember, both of those are forms of chlorine, so you can actually trip yourself up like we did. Our visual, here you can see at 100 ppm, we yield 90 ppm of our hypochlorous acid at 6.5. You can see down here at 100 ppm, it yields 10 ppm of our hypochlorous acid at 8.5. So very poor in terms of our reduction of foodborne pathogens. So you can imagine at a pH of 10, we were really getting nothing, which was basically about equivalent to our water. So that was why that didn't work. And just showing you how important it is to make sure that yes, you do get the proper concentration of your sanitizer, but if it says that it is pH sensitive or dependent, pH is really important to monitor and make a pH adjustment if you need to. In this particular case, we were able to adjust our pH back down to about 7 with citric acid, and we were able to see our reduction of microorganisms that was equivalent to our peroxyacetic acid. You can also see if you take the pH too low, you will actually start getting off-gassing of chlorine, which would be a complete OSHA issue in terms of making your workers pass out. So not only did you get a little bit of research about harvest bags, but you also now got a small tutorial on chlorine chemistry. But I think it's important to really dive into the research and make sure that things are making sense. And this was really important as we worked through these results with our industry stakeholders in terms of making recommendations and practical applications. So that is what we are gonna discuss next. And this is my favorite part because this is where the rubber really meets the road. So what did we figure out? Harvest bags should have a sanitation SOP. And Craig did all the hard work uh, for us by giving us a really great draft or mock SOP for our harvest bags. And that template that we can modify based on our own operation. In terms of the frequency of sanitation, how do you establish those clean breaks? How do you break up where those lots should be in case you ever needed to have a recall? It's gonna depend on what your comfort level is with the risk and how often do you think that your bags might become contaminated. We can see from 
our data, if they are contaminated, it definitely can hang around. So frequency should be set on if the bag becomes contaminated, if a known contamination event occurs, bags should be cleaned, sanitized, and fully dried before use. I've underlined fully dried before use because all of our data would suggest that if the bags are wet, transfer is more likely to occur and survival is more likely to occur. So keeping the bags dry is extremely important. The picture to the right of the screen is our IPA quat which was our dry based treatment that was very effective. We nearly got a five log reduction of our foodborne pathogens on our harvest bags. We also would like to move away or minimize the use of canvas bags or move towards less porous materials. So try and transition out canvas if possible. This also turned out to have some really neat research from a farmer's market standpoint or a grocery store standpoint because a lot of people take canvas tote bags and use them to collect food. And then again, how often do we really do a full clean and sanitize treatment of those bags, right? Maybe we launder them, but really I think they just live probably in our trunks of our cars. So anytime we can move away from these porous type materials to less porous materials is great. Our bag manufacturers and working with the Cordura type materials and the improvements and the technology on Cordura type bags, PVC coatings, antimicrobials, all offer promising solutions. We also want to aim to store bags properly, achieve visibly clean, and minimize water. So those are the big ones in terms of what to take away from this. Likely you're all doing a really good job and these are maybe small tweaks that you can implement in your operation. Alexis Hamilton, an assistant professor and extension specialist in the food science department with Laura at Virginia Tech. And I'm going to take over the PowerPoint here and talk a little bit about some additional research updates that we have for you. These are going to be related to both the Apple storage environment and the food contact surfaces in packing houses. And we'll convert this research into some actionable recommendations for you that you can use on a day to day basis. The approach that Laura has talked about so far in the presentation is one that we use very commonly in our integrated research and extension programs because we think that this is really the best, most efficient way that we can provide actionable recommendations that are based on science to support the work that we do to enhance the safety of the product everywhere from the farm into the packing house or the storage environment out through distribution and to the consumer. This next study that I want to talk about really tries to answer this question of how do some common quality issues that we see impact food safety issues that we might also see in the Apple storage environment. And we developed this project in a way that would make our results and so our recommendations more relevant to the industry. So you can see on this slide, we harvested apples and we treated them with a the fungicide in the same way that the industry would. Then we inoculated them with listeria or with listeria and botrytis scenaria, which causes gray mold, and listeria and penicillium expansum, which causes um, blue mold. But these are very common necrotic pathogens that we would expect to see show up in storage. Then we treated those apples with an ethylene inhibitor, again, in accordance with what the industry might do. And we stored our apples for one, three, six, nine, and 11 months before we enumerated or counted those listeria colonies. And we plated them out on a medium that is really commonly used in the industry uh, to confirm their presence of whether they were there or not from six months onward. What we tended to see was that listeria populations decreased on the apples during the storage environment for the entire time that they were in storage. It got to a point that listeria counts were so low that we couldn't detect them without um, doing PCR and trying to amplify the DNA that was there. And so what does this mean? How can we take this data and how can we apply some actionable recommendations based on it? Right? What might this mean for you in your day-to-day -day operation? How could you use this to improve your harvest storage and packing operations today? Well, I've broken the recommendations down into what you can do before the apples go into storage and then what you can do after they come out. But we're going to talk about the pre-storage options first. First, you're going to want to adjust your harvest practices to minimize damage to the fruit as best you can. This is likely something that you're already doing. Here, we're highlighting how there's a synergistic quality and food safety impact 
and really focusing on prioritizing these practices. We know that some apple varieties have really woody stems that can puncture the apple peel even while it's still in the picking bag. So if you're harvesting some of those varieties, you could consider clipping the stems at harvest to reduce the likelihood that those stem punctures might occur. If you know that some of your varieties are really sensitive to splitting, like uh, Gala or Honeycrisp apples might be, it helps to work to be sure that you're harvesting at the right maturity stage for the fruit to minimize the likelihood of this happening, of the splitting to occur. And this will ultimately help reduce the likelihood of fungal decay in storage as well, or rot. Next, if the fruit has dropped to the ground and that's not a part of your standard harvesting practices, don't harvest it. Again, this is something that you're very likely already doing. And so here we're highlighting how this can have a synergistic safety and quality impact for the crop. We know that dropped produce could easily become contaminated with foodborne pathogens that might be in the soil or those fungal spores that may overwinter in that orchard environment in plant or in leaf debris that might be on the orchard floor. If you noticed the fruit is damaged, whether this is a stem puncture or a bird peck or something like that, or if the fruit is bruised, don't harvest this crop either. We know that wounded fruit or damaged fruit like this gives microorganisms that are on the surface of the apple or the peel of that produce. It gives them access to the juice that's inside, which can allow these organisms to grow or ultimately help them better survive during these kind of long storage times. Third, you want to work to optimize your fungicide program to target a variety of fungal pathogens. There are lots of resources available now about setting up your fungicide program to target different fungal pathogens with different types of chemicals at different times, and that might help you figure out how this can help you combat some of the fungicide resistance behavior that we're seeing much more commonly now. So you might also consider using one of the at-risk fungicides with either another fungicide or a non-chemical control measure. And we know that of course, for organic operations, fungicide applications like this may not be available to you. In this case, you can then prioritize management strategies in the orchard itself. Sanitation practices can include things like removing decayed fruit from the orchard floor because we know this can reduce fungal inoculum loads or how many of those necrotic fungal pathogens that can decay the apple in storage, how we can reduce the likelihood that they'll contact the crop. It's also important to emphasize the cleaning and sanitation of storage rooms, of your harvesting equipment, and packing house surfaces as well to hopefully limit the spread of some of these fungal disorders and also foodborne pathogens. When it's time to remove the fruit from storage and prep for packing and distribution, you want to do your best to remove any visibly damaged or decayed fruit before contacting the packing line. Where or how might you be able to do this? If your operation is set up to do this, you could pre-sort your commodities before they enter the dump tank or before they make contact with the formal packing line. Doing this will also enhance or prolong the efficacy of your sanitizer, so how well that's working in your dump tank by limiting the amount of organic matter and the fungal organisms that might be in that dump tank, which ultimately leaves more of that sanitizer available to interact with foodborne pathogens. But if this isn't possible, either because your line or your production schedule is not set up to accommodate this, then you can instead emphasize trying to remove these apples as soon as possible before you hit any kind of spray bar. This includes your soap, your water, your sanitizer, and your wax spray bars if you're using those. But this is also helpful if you utilize a rot removal step that blasts rot away with a pressurized water stream. This will also help with this as well. This helps ensure that if there is a food safety problem linked to a decayed apple, it's less likely to be aerosolized across the line, other apples, or your facility as a whole. It keeps it out of the air and localized in one place where it's easier to control and remove. So we've spent some time talking about the storage environment. Now what happens when you remove those apples from the storage environment and they're getting ready to roll across your packing line? So the recommendations that we've come up with here are separated based on whether or not the organisms or the product is running along a food contact surface that is directly contacting the crop, or if it's a non-food contact surface like the floor, a drain, a forklift perhaps. If we look at the food contact surfaces side, we see that 
The data shows that cleaning frequently is really important to prevent creating harborage points where microorganisms can get trapped and can be protected from the activity of a sanitizer. Harborage points are places where you're getting perhaps nutrients or moisture into a space and you aren't getting that out. And so an organism that can fit down in there is going to be able to consume those nutrients, use that water for metabolic activity. And because the sanitizer can't get in there to kill the organism, that organism becomes protected, is then allowed to grow, and that can become an inoculation point moving forward. And one of the places that we see that there is a particular risk here is with the brush beds underneath those wax spray bars. We know that waxes are lipid-based, they're fat-based materials. And what this can do is this can absolutely encase and prevent those organisms from being contacted by a sanitizer. And we know that sanitization is absolutely critical in these environments. Most of the listeria positives on food contact surfaces that we've seen, the data shows that these are transient. These might be coming in at different times a year on the crop themselves. Most of the time in packing houses that have a really strong cleaning and sanitizing program, that listeria is continually moving out because your sanitation program is killing those organisms. Um, and then you get continual reintroduction perhaps from the crop um, itself. And then, of course, communication uh, is going to be key when an employee notices that something has changed or if something seems off. These studies that look at listeria prevalence in packing houses all tend to show that listeria prevalence is packing house specific. So different packing houses show different recovery rates. And one of the hypotheses for why we think this happens is because we think this is indirectly hitting on the food safety culture. So the culture that you have in your operation around communicating changes or increasing the frequency of a sanitizing event or noticing when things are going wrong seems to help some packing houses better prevent listeria entry and harborage than others. Now, if we pivot and we think about our non-food contact surfaces, we know that with an environmental monitoring program, the goal of a really good EMP is to look for listeria positives. This shows you that you were able to detect the organism when it's there. And so then you can target your sanitizing approaches to be able to remove that organism once you know where it likes to hang out. But of course, you may also be not speciating for Listeria monocytogenes. You may choose to just look at a Listeria species positive at the genus level. And if you do, that's fine. We encourage you to treat those Listeria genera positives as if it was a pathogen, right? And take action in the same way you would if you were trying to eradicate a pathogen from an environment. So that means implementing a cleaning and a sanitizing step and then some sort of verification activity like a swab or a micro test to prove that those organisms have been removed. We also encourage you to minimize moisture accumulation. One of the things we know is bringing water into the packing house like the equivalent of putting a listeria on a bus, right? It helps an organism move much farther, much faster when there is water or moisture in the environment. So when we keep things dry, it makes it harder for not just microorganisms to persist, but also it makes it harder for them to move around and to contaminate other areas of our operation. Minimizing those uh, moisture accumulation sites or opportunities will be really key here. This might look like making sure that you are squeegeeing all of the water that might be um, on the ground towards the drain so that it can collect and be pulled away. This might also mean making sure that you've got condensation drip pans under all of your coolers to be sure that you don't have condensate dripping onto the crop. Here again, we know on our non-food contact surfaces, sanitation is critical. Once again, we know that if listeria is coming in continually, the best defense we have for preventing a harborage point besides eliminating um, nutrient sources is to focus on those sanitization steps that can kill or reduce the number of those organisms um, at the sanitizing event. And then something that's more recently been shown in the literature, which you can see these are a note about what sources they came from is here at the bottom left of the slide. But we're noticing that one of the things that can be really helpful in figuring out whether or not you do have transient versus resident or harbored listeria in your operation is periodically including sites upstream in your EMP and in your sampling activities, right? So before the crop comes into the packing house, are you checking transport vehicles if you're putting if you're bringing bins into the packing house on the back of a pickup or on a semi, are you 
implementing some sort of environmental monitoring event to maybe swab those areas and see how frequently those organisms can be identified there. Observing things like employee traffic patterns can also be helpful for helping you understand how listeria might be moving in, around, or through your operation. But your cold storage areas should be included here as well. So this might include short-term storage before crop gets packed out and shipped out, could also be those long-term controlled atmosphere or regular atmosphere um, storage environments as well, making sure that those are cleaned and sanitized regularly, particularly as we know the crop may decay during storage, you might get some uh, buildup of plant debris um, as those apples decay. You wanna be keeping an eye on what those are and where they are so that you can readily remove, clean and sanitize to prevent a hard bridge point there as well talked about the storage environment, we talked about the packing house surfaces, but what impact does the packing line itself have on the crop, right? How does rolling that apple across a packing line impact the microorganisms that are on the surface of the apple? We don't know the answer to this question, but we are looking into it now. Um, we are working with collaborators in the Pacific Northwest to describe some of these changes in tree fruit microbiota, so the microorganisms that are on the outside of the crop, on that peel area that you might eat. And we're checking what those look like before and after a pre-sorting step before those apples go into a long-term storage environment. And the idea here is we're trying to examine how this pre-sorting step actually impacts food safety risks prior to going into that long-term storage. If you are interested in reading a bit more, you can hold your phone up to the screen onto the QR code and it should link you to a summary page and a progress update about this project. It's currently funded by the Center for Produce Safety. This is available for you to read, but of course, if you have any questions about what the data is looking like now or what we might expect in a few more sampling time points, we'd be more than happy to answer those questions here in the Q&A session in a bit. Oh, this was a little bit of a research blitz. I know we said we were doing some additional research updates, but there's so much more to the story right around this research that we don't get to share in the amount of time that we have. If you're interested in learning a bit more about the data that was presented here today and any of the published manuscripts that that data might be coming out of, those are listed here on this slide, but Laura and I, of course, are happy to share them with you if you have any questions. Uh, this is work that we both worked really hard on to be sure that these are really actionable and applied recommendations that can come out of this work that are ultimately usable. And of course, a really important step around sharing the science is not just that it's shared, but how it's shared. So you'll see here using the Apple storage study as an example, you'll see three different ways that we have worked to get these data out to the public where you can use it as you need to. So we've published and we've shared these in a couple different ways. The Apple study is currently published as an open access as a free scientific manuscript if you actually want to read the specific data. It's in the Journal of Food Protection, but the key findings from this article are also published in a tree fruit news article um, that was published through Washington State University's tree fruit publications. Um, it's also in a free infographic that you can use either as a practical handout in trainings or that you can post as a guidance in packing houses as well. We recognize that the example that's on the slide is a little bit hard to read with some neon yellows and greens and a mostly neutral background. So we've edited this so that the published handout now is much easier to read and is in Virginia Cooperative Extension colors. It's very important to us, of course, that this work be widely available and not stuck behind a paywall if we can help it. So we'll provide the same level of commitment right, to disseminating these findings from this study as with any of the others that we were ever involved in. And if there's any questions, I know Laura, Craig, and I are all really excited to answer and discuss with you some questions that you might have in the open Q&A here in a couple minutes.